the autumn equinox is a great time to sit and reflect, to show gratitude, and to really understand how this last year has landed with you. So today I'm talking with Danica Connors, who has been on for the past year, um, talking about the eight Sabbaths or the Wheel of Life. Uh, today is the culmination of those eight episodes, uh, talking about our autumn equinox and our fall equinox. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the different ways that you can honor this time of the year, uh, the rituals that you can recognize, and maybe some of the practices um, that you can do for yourself, for your community, or for your family. Uh, love Danica. Appreciate all the information that she has. Really, really love the idea of the eight Sabbaths and the Wheel of Life. It's helped me personally um, understand a little bit more of life and understand the time to hit the gas pedal and the time to sit and reflect. So I really hope you get something out of this conversation. We'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome back to our show. Uh, joining me is one of my favorite guests. I love this woman. Her name is Danica Connors. She's been on multiple times. Um, so if you've been following the series, uh, we've been releasing episodes throughout the year that uh, reflect the eight Sabbaths and the Wheel of Life, um, recognized by pagan and Wiccan uh, practitioners and holidays. And, uh, and Danica has just gifted us with all the knowledge that she has walking us through all of these rituals, all of these uh, remembrances, these, these beautiful uh, ceremonies. And, and really explaining how they land with us in our lives, right? And, and so for me personally, I'm still very new to all of this and, and just trying to maybe extract one or two rituals from each of these to practice around those times. And, uh, and I can personally say, like, it's, it's been very revolutionary in my life. It's, it's helped immensely. Um, and, you know, I just I, – I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s where we didn't have a lot of uh, recognition for the, the earth, Right. Uh, the, the, the main thing I remember in, in uh, the 80s and 90s was the, the, the TV commercial, Don't Mess With Texas. You oh, know? And it was God. basically like Texas finally got tired of everybody throwing their trash out the windows on the freeways. And so there was this big campaign that was Don't Mess With Texas. But there was like, I still go down to Texas. They still don't recycle. Like there's still like major areas of Houston that don't recycle. Right. So there's like, you know, there's, there's, there wasn't very a big push on like nature and be outdoors and take care of the world and all this shit. And so this is very beautiful for me because it gives me a kind of a roadmap and a blueprint to, to recognize the world, to recognize the spirits, to recognize myself. Right. Um, so we are today talking about the autumn equinox, my bone, and I am very excited to have you back. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Adam. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. The, um, you know, autumn equinox, we're beginning to, all of us are already beginning to see it. You know, you see the, the, mm -hmm. the crisp in the air is starting mm -hmm. to happen and the leaves are starting to turn and things are starting to wither on the branches and, you know, our farmer's markets are going nuts mm -hmm. and all of the harvests are where they are and you're starting to hear, you know, Canadian geese do their thing and all of these kind of calls to understanding that we are now doing the big switch mm -hmm. from light to dark and autumn equinox all of the equinoxes spring equinox autumn equinoxes are time of balance of the balance of day and night equal night and equal day and they are times of preparation so you need to take stock in the spring for spring equinox you're taking stock of what needs to shed in order to get ready for all of this activity mm -hmm. while now we are really sitting and taking stock about of what has happened not just in the summer months but almost for the whole year because our next phase is Samhain which is our new year mm -hmm. so it is a time to sit still and go really reflect this is a real time of deep reflection to go what were my experiences what worked what didn't what am I working really, really hard right now? Because we're still, all this energy is going out to harvest, 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 harvest. We don't, we're not slowing down. And in some cases, we're oddly speeding up oh God, at God. this time out of this almost borderline instinctive desperation because we know the dark and the slowdown is coming, right? Mm -hmm. So... Autumn equinox, yes, that equal time, equal day, but it's pre prepping for something different. And it was always also called at a time, like you said, um, Mabon. And that's an interesting, yeah. <laughs> this is an interesting thing because there's, so Aidan Kelly in the 70s, he was an author, 
big practitioner of Wicca, he basically, <laughs> he basically aesthetically didn't like how certain things were named in the wheel of the year, right? So many of the others, like the big Celtic festivals, like um, Bjöltina or Beltane and Samhain and Imolg and Lunasa are all very Celtic kind of things. And the equinoxes are just equinox, right? right? So he actually kind of fished around to find something that kind of mimicked the myth of the great, um, of Persephone okay. and the Eleusinian mysteries, but in a more Celtic Welsh way. Okay. And the closest thing he could find was um, Mabon ap Modron. And this was a, basically that translates into divine child. Okay. All and right. it was basically this child was born and was abducted within three nights and was put into a, I believe it was like a, a jail under the sea and was never seen again. Oh. And believe me, there's very little mentioned about him at all in Welsh, Welsh mythology. Okay. So this was kind of a desperate grab of something that didn't really mix with the the connection to what was happening, yet okay. somehow in its own way just stuck yeah. in Wiccan circles. And instead of even Mabon, it's now called Mabon, right? In okay. its own, you know, processes. But we really don't, like, there's the divine child. We see a lot of that that happens throughout the year. Mm -hmm. You know, the divine child's born, grows, dies at her hand, and comes through again. So mm -hmm. it's kind of there but not really. Right. And there are many, many Wiccan circles that are like, no, not Mabin. Yeah. We'll and it's, stick with autumn and it's more autumn equinox. Yeah. But there's also things like Harvest Home. Oh. That's one of the oldest traditional um, European harvest festivals. And it was kind of Anglo, um, kind of uh, Celtic in a bit. And it was a break in the giant harvest time oh, okay. in order to celebrate okay right so it was in its own way a time for giving thanks for the harvest okay that's what it is so this time frame became known as the witch's thanksgiving oh i love that right in its way <laughs> so it is a time where you are harvesting and it is about food okay. and the thanks that you give at that time so that's kind of where Mabon changed into Mabon, but Maybe. it doesn't really make that much sense Yeah, in, in many ways where it sticks. I'm a big fan of, of Autumn Equinox. It's one of my favorites. So that's kind of the name around how it goes. Right. And it always falls exactly at the time of equal night and equal day. And that rotates. That can be September 20th, September 21st, mm -hmm. September 22nd, depending because it's a solar thing, okay. which doesn't perfectly fit into our calendar. Is so 23rd this year? 22nd. 22nd actually. this year. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. It is the 22nd. Well, and there, there, I mean, you mentioned something too, and, and this is, so anybody just approaching this, the Eight Wheels of Life uh, or the Eight Stop, it's, it's, it can be overwhelming, right? Even though this does make a lot of sense, it's still a lot of new stuff. You might be practicing, you know, your culture's holidays and uh, say, maybe see some, uh, some similarities here. But, but the thing that I've really noticed with, uh, with these stages throughout the year is, um, is the so you just kind of touched on it with the reflection side <clears throat> i if i really just kind of like just stop for a second and think about yesterday yesterday seems like covid times right and we're in 2023 right now and mm -hmm. covid was 2020 right mm -hmm. we move so fast through life right so fast like literally like we're in september now i remember just going to uh, the the beach for the first time in june and it seemed like <laughs> two days ago right we go fast through life. And I think we need to have these pauses to reflect. And whether it's a built-in pause as an excuse to reflect, uh, we, we, we get ritualistic with our pauses to reflect, we need to have that time to slow down and really kind of take, take credit and take stock of what just happened because we go so fast throughout the time, like we, years can go by and we have no idea what just happened. So taking that time to stop, reflect and say, okay, how was this year? What, am I happy? Am I happy? 
When's the last time you asked yourself that question and were honest with yourself with the answer, right? Because this is, I heard a speaker not too long ago talking about human rights and they were saying human rights are very rarely ever given out. They're fought for, right? This is your human right, right? Your right as a human being to be happy. Are you happy? Are you happy with the time you've had? Are you happy with the time that you've given your friends and family and yourself? Are you working all the time? Do you have a hobby that you're, you're passionate about? When's the last time you moved your body? Right? Because if we don't ask ourselves these questions, very rarely does somebody ask them to us. So having those pauses built into where we can reflect and then you are the impetus for that change. Change your life moving forward. I'm going to start doing this this day of the week or I'm going to move my body or I'm going to sit and meditate or I'm going to read a book a week, whatever the fuck it is. But these are where those changes start to happen when we pause, we slow down, we reflect and we realize I'm not happy or guess what? This was a great fucking year. I'm really happy. Let's try to recreate this in some kind of way, right? Build in those reflection moments. Yeah. Have that opportunity. The wheel of the year, and it's something that I say all the time when I lead ritual for any of the Sabbaths, it's we pause to mark the turning of the wheel of the year. It is a, it's a pause because the, the great wheel is ever, ever, ever turning. Yeah. It never stops. And yes, we are a part of that great turning. And so to pause does help the overwhelm. It, it does help the go, go, go. Yeah. And it does help you realign with where you are and your part in that ever turning circle and right. the parts that you do have control over and what you would like to do with it. And I, I would, that's part of why for me, um, Wicca called so clearly mm. because I, as a person move very fast within the fast speed <laughs> of what we have. And I would often feel lost yeah. amidst that. And this process helps me just plug in. Mm. And with, you know, with autumn equinox, you know, part of that reflection is how do I slow down? You know, this culture insists we keep at speed, even in the dark, and your body won't do it. Right, yeah. Your body absolutely won't do it, you know? I'm actually reading a book right now called Why We Sleep, and it's uh, about the science of sleep and what the benefits are and all this stuff, and it's a fascinating book. If you haven't, anybody check it out. I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but Why We Sleep. And uh, I just finished a, a section where they're talking about how mammals... Um, need to be awoken from sleep naturally. We don't do well when we're jarred awake, awake, right? Fight or flight kicks in, we go into panic mode. And we are in a culture where we force ourselves out of sleep every single fucking day to go to work, to go do the things we need to do. Very rare, I think it was the, the, the study they put out was, I think it was somewhere between 60 to 7% of the, the world's population gets less than six hours of sleep a night. So much so that the World Health Organization is now considered um, sleep, uh, the world in a sleep crisis, right? And so we're constantly pulling ourselves out of the naturalness that we find, that we desire, that we're, we're fucking nature. We're part of, we're part of nature. We've, we've uh, evolved to a point to where we can be tool users and we can build shit, but we're still part of nature. And so to continuously take us out of these moments where we could have longer sleep, where we embrace the darkness, where we embrace the light and we can be more active, we're, we're constantly putting ourselves in these places where we don't naturally want to be. And then we judge ourselves for not being able to show up in those spaces, mm -hmm. right? We don't give ourselves grace for not wanting to work from, you know, 11 o'clock at night till seven o'clock in the morning, six days a week, maybe get a week off a year and then wonder why I've got cancer at the age of 30. Mm -hmm because you've just fucked your entire body chemistry up, right? But we're in that culture where this is the norm. We keep pushing, 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 going, going, going. And then we, we talk shit and we, we uh, talk negatively about the slowdown, right? Embrace that slowdown. Embrace that, that time where you can reflect and really understand what's going on with you, what's working, what's not. Yeah, and the, that bodily that's going to happen whether we want it or not, you know, those of us who are in, um, are in our twilight, you know, the autumn... Autumn equinox is in the western corner of the wheel. Hmm. It's the place where we turn and twilight happens. It's where the sun starts setting. It's where the transition out of this world begins, right? And those of us who are 50 or older are in it, mm -hmm. right? We, we, there's no way. We're in a culture that believes only in light, right? right? Youth, energy, 
production, 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 production. And we can sit here for hours and talk about how ineffective that actually is. Right. right? But as we are older in, in, in a culture that does not um, honor age and hold aging, the aging process as sacred, mm -hmm. you know, we have all the things that try and cover it up. But when we stand, you know, I'm, I'm 53 and I, for some reason this year, this time around, this autumn equinox, I'm like, wow, this is where I am. Mm. This is it now. Yeah. This is exactly who I am and where I am. And I struggle to find out what that means because mm. you're somebody different, yeah. completely different from what this culture wants. Right? Yeah. So who are you and where is your value? So there's this automatic reevaluation. There's this automatic turning in. There's this automatic redefining of what is valuable and what is sacred no matter who else gives a fuck. Right, yeah. Or what they want it to be. Yeah. I think it's so important to embrace these stages in our life. And, and I mean, I've talked about this on, not maybe not with you and, and on this show, but on this podcast I've talked about it. But, you know, we, we've been in a culture for the past, I mean, again, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I can remember seeing commercials when I had, you know, network television that it was beauty creams and age, age reversal stuff. And you should diet because to get rid of the wrinkles or all this stuff to, to reverse the natural progression of our bodies and, and, you know, and whatever, do what you need to do to feel good about your body, right? Good about your life. But where I see the, where I see the issue with always trying to be young is that if you take the archetypes, right? Um, so in the archetypes, we have um, sage and, and crone phases, right? And if we're not stepping towards those and embracing that age and the wisdom that comes with that age, part of the job of the, the sage and the crone is to embrace the age, embrace the knowledge, but impart the knowledge back on the younger generations coming up because you've got lived experience now, right? And if we don't embrace the age that we're at and at 70 years old, I'm still acting like I'm 30 and 40. Where is that age and that wisdom that I get to impart now to my grandkids or to the kids and the, the, the people around me? It's not there. It's starved, right? And so if you look at a lot of the culture in the West, you have starved people that don't have culture, that don't have an understanding of how to gracefully move through life. <clears throat> so I think that the, the opportunities for us to embrace, like I've got, I just, I found my first gray beard hair the other day and it's sticking out oh, like a middle congratulations. finger. Right? Congratulations. I'm so happy. I'm like, yes, I've been <laughs> waiting for you to get there, you know? And I get like age is looked at differently between uh, gender men and women. And we'll see how age looks at with, uh, you know, gender neutral and by, you know, uh, all these different uh, ideas that are coming out. And hopefully maybe that's part of the change that's needed to happen to stop looking at people that age as not being part of society or now you're broken or now we've mm -hmm. got to take care of you or you've got no more worth, right? Mm -hmm. No, we do, right? Everybody does. And I think if we can, as a human, as a humanity, embrace that, that age and, and again, work with the wheel of life. And this is that bigger part of the wheel of life, right? The moving with the ages that we are embracing that journey I think we we could be more set up as a society to weather some of this change that goes on. That the the conversations like we, we before we hit record, we were talking about inability to have conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can take that that arrogance of the twenties and then learn how to integrate the wisdom of the thirties, and then learn how the the forties, you really understand that nothing you knew ever made any sense, and that you're just basically a child now, and you're finally the ego is small enough that you can really attain information and figure out how it lands, and then in your fifties you turn into that you know we move into that crows postmenopausal for women you know in that in in the idea that now my family if i had a family is raised they're on their own they're good to go now i can put that love that i've had for just my family in whatever way that is to the world mm -hmm. to the community right but if we can't embrace and open up our hearts like that we have the starved people that just are walking around doing the best they can but there could be a layer of help that's there and that's why for what i love about um the the divinity and how it presents itself in the wheel of the year in Wicca, you know, the, the goddess right now is prep. She's still like all of her energy is going in and out to the bountiful harvest mm. that is still coming and coming and coming. And that's all of this energy of like, here, this all comes, but she's prepping because right past that day, she's crone. 
right past that day, she mm. steps into the place of the aging and the wisdom and what that is. And the God is doing the same thing. You know, when the first harvest started, this is, you know, our second harvest right. of fall fruits and vegetables and, and seeds and nuts and, and the wine and all of that stuff, right? So we had our first harvest of the first fruits and then we have our second harvest coming here. And the God's sacrifice and that energy of that is still happening and happening and happening and happening. And he is prepping for the final one where he leaves this plane entirely and the that is that ultimate death mm. so we're seeing within death and the changes that happen in our in our divinity it's not just this uniform non-aging concept our divine our sources of divinity for us in Wicca go through what we go through yeah. it's a macrocosm microcosm so that and it's, it's a constant circle so that I'm going through this in order to go through reincarnation or whatever that process is, I'm now in this. And that does mean the wisdom of pain, mm -hmm. the wisdom of loss, the wisdom as we recede, right? right? We're seeing, like I walked out on my deck this morning and I have a beautiful Japanese maple there mm -hmm. and her leaves are turning now. Yeah. They're just turning. And I just walked out there and I really noticed it for the first time today. And I put my hand on one of her leaves and I just breathe. I just took a huge breath and went, give me strength mm. to do what you do. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know? And so I love that this whole macrocosm, microcosm thing. The divine is doing what's happening. The earth is doing what's happening. We're doing what's happening. Even if we're fighting against it, we can't step out of the circle. Right. Because we are a part of it. Right. And it's, it's nice to know that as the harvest occurs, so does our lives. As the releasing occurs, so do our lives. As right. the rebirthing occurs, so do our lives. It's that reinforcement that we are intricately connected. Yes. I mean, just think if a tree, a maple tree, that maple tree you just talked about, what if, what if that tree never lost its leaves? I know. You know, what if, uh, you know, what if you know, the, the, the natural progression of life just didn't happen? Like bears didn't hibernate, mm -hmm. right? You know, there's, there's all these things that, that just need to happen to, to let the world move in, in its natural way. <clears throat> and the more we start to manipulate it, the more those little micro effects start to happen that we might not see on a grand scale, but over time we start to see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've referenced that book, Why We Sleep. And another thing that they talked about recently was um, uh, sleeping pills and how sleeping pills, yeah, they might knock you out, but is that sleep, right? And there's studies now that the sleeping pills have been out for a long enough time to do these studies. And there's almost like a 30% increased cancer rate for people that take sleeping pills. Interesting. And the, the mortality rate for anybody taking sleeping pills for, I think, over five years, um, you know, the, the mortality rate goes, you're going to die quicker, right? Die Interesting. Sooner. And so one of the hypotheses with that is that, okay, you're maybe getting your eyes shut and your body's going into stasis, but the benefits that sleep gives you like the, 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 the rest and relax, you know, the, the, the metaphor there, or the, the picture I like to use in my head is when your rest and relax kicks in and you're in natural sleep, that's when, that's your time when you're like your cleaning crew comes out, right? Your little janitors come out, they start sweeping out the cobwebs in your, in your lungs and then cleaning out the corners of your liver and doing all the, the maintenance shit that your body needs. Mm -hmm. But if we're knocking ourselves out, whether through of uh, sleep medication, alcohol, drugs of some sort, we're not allowing the body to go into that rest and repair. We're just clonking ourselves out, right? And we're zonking out. And so that rest and repair is obviously something we need. We're not getting it over time. That builds up and then we die early, right? And so it's, it's again, it's like we got to have that natural part of life. And the more we start to shortchange it, these little things that may seem insignificant at the time end up building up over time. And do you want to knock 30 years off of your life if you're living a happy life? Probably not, right? <laughs> You know, I probably want to live those 30 years, you know, see what happens. Right. So, you know, so it's, again, it's like understanding why you're doing what you're doing. If you're shortchanging something, be ready for some consequences for it. Right. But maybe finding a way to, um, to open yourself up to some of these ideas that have been around for millennia that we've shunned because we're not part of nature anymore, according mm -hmm. to the Webster Dictionary. Mm -hmm. And we find our ways to integrate this back into our lives. Yeah, because it's about consciously letting go. To sleep mm. on your own, you have to make the decision to let 
go. That's interesting. I've never thought about it like that. If you cannot let go, you're not going to sleep. Mm. If your body can't let go, you're not going to sleep. If your mind cannot let go, you are not going to sleep. Sleep is contingent upon the ability to let go. Yeah. Right? I love sleep. And God, I do too. Fucking I wish I got sleep. more of it. Believe me. And and it is. It's the, it is better if you have a sleep reg- you know hygiene around it. How to shut off certain things. How to you know, trigger your body into releasing its own melatonin so right. it knows how to do this. But this is what autumn equinox is about. This is your sleep hygiene. Mm. Right here. Yeah. Right? This is how you stop and go, I need to let go in order to survive this winter. Mm. Yeah. What do I harvest in and hold close? And what do I let go of? In order, in order to do this, it is so. Uh, this, this moment of reflection, to me, you know, you can hear. I can hear at this time of year. I can hear the goddess over my shoulder going, "What worked and what didn't." And you have from now until Samhain, because hmm. it's Samhain, is when the final letting go occurs. Right. You've got to think about this. You need to finish what you've started. Yeah, it, there was a, a, a big kind of, <clears throat> you know, energy around leaving things not finished at this time. Okay. That's where you leave energetic doorways that just bleed you dry mm. through the winter. You have to put the garden to bed. You have to do all, you have to finish the things in this time frame. Right. And I, um, so that you can plan for other things, Mm -hmm. you know. For me, the planning is, okay, so what kind of, you know, if we're talking just from an agricultural style thing, what kind of food do I need to get through? Yes, you're going to be making your wines. You're going to be, you know, canning your tomatoes. You're going to be making your jams and jellies. Like, that is glorious. In another day and age, that wasn't glorious. That was necessity or you die. Right, yeah. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So this is a different thing, but also it's like, okay, for me, I'm like, what is my reading list going to be this winter? Ah, uh, yes. What am I going to knit there you go. this winter? You know, I, I think it's a running joke between me and my friends who really know me because it's like the geese. The second, the second you hear the geese and they start moving for me, the second the crisp starts in the air, I go, what am I going to knit? <laughs> What am I going to knit? I only knit during the cold months. It's oh, yeah. literally almost like a like a literal genetic style response for me. And I love that. There is something deep embedded within me that goes, how do you take care of yourself and do something that slows down? Mm. Yeah. You know, because for me, knitting is a repetitive process that slows me down. Right. right? And I didn't even know that that's what I was doing. And now it's a sacred act to prepare your, your goals. I don't need goals. That's too active. That's not the right word. (laughs) Goals are too active. I don't like that. To prepare your gentle activities. There you go. You know, of the things that nurture you slowly. Mm. Because if we think of the fact that the fruits fall from the trees and the seeds fall into the darkness of the womb of the mother, where they are held Mm -hmm. and nurtured in silence. And that is what we are doing. We are putting the seeds of ourselves and our dreams into the womb of the mother during the darkness in order to be nurtured so that it can prepare. They can be prepared and ready for that time. But we can't jump to that time. That's not the goal. The beauty, what I love about paganism is that the dark and the light are just a part of themselves. Right. They, one is not better than another. It's not how that works. They are two parts of a whole that are constantly feeding each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things I'd like people to do is take your time to, to make some gentle activity plans for yourself. I, 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 we, we need that in general. I mean, there's like, we, we keep talking about how fast life is and we can go through years without even thinking about it. 
but having having these 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 hobbies, right? These these focuses that we can have. Like I remember, uh, in, you know, even until like I'm I'm 43 now, until maybe my mid 30s, I kept always wondering like, why do old people always get like these weird hobbies, right? And you know, <laughs> generic use of the word old people. You know, that's a young thing. You know, 20s thing to say. But, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, like my mom gardened and right? she got into gardening in her 50s and 60s and through her 70s until she passed, um, you know, uh, you know, and I, and I see like knitting and crocheting and like scrapbooking and you know, all this fun stuff, you know, and it's like, what, what are you doing with your time? Right. But I get it now. Like, I totally get it. Like we are so moving in life that we need to create these times to reflect and to slow down and to like, if you tried to speed crochet something. You're going to fuck something up. You're either going to like get a, one of those needles under your nail. You're going to get the pattern wrong, whatever happens, right? So we need to take that time to slow down. Like cooking is a beautiful way too. Oh, like unless you're cooking crazy. in a restaurant, take your time, have, have fun, make love with the food while you're making it, right? Like have that passion with there because, you know, like the, the slower you take to like, you know, process the herbs that you're chopping and maybe talk to them while you're doing it, you know, and create this relationship with the meal you're making. You know, there's, there's just such a beauty in that slowness that we can create. We're, we're already, we've proven as a society, we're really good at going fast. We're really good at trying to accomplish shit, right? Whether we accomplish it or not, that's not part of the question. It's just, we try our hardest. <laughs> so like having these times to slow down and then not guilting ourselves for doing it. Yeah. And that, that's why the activities should be nurturing. Hmm. Yeah, you know? What are the activities for uh, for Equinox? Yeah, so what I love is, um, you know, get creative with this kind of thing. First of all, on that day, I love, watch the sunset. Mm. Watch that sunset. Say goodbye. Yeah. You know, as you're watching that sunset, you can do reflection. Journey, meditate. Mm -hmm. Meditate on the past year. What worked, what didn't. What do you, and write if you need to. Write what is staying, what is going. Think about the activities mm. that may bring nurturance and slowing down for yourself, you know, as you watch that sunset, you know, and say goodbye mm -hmm. um, to the light half of the year. Yeah. You know, um, I love a gratitude ceremony of some mm. kind, you know, really touch base with what you are grateful for, Yeah. you know. Um, the other thing is to know what you need to finish oh yeah be aware of what things what what little ties are untied what things are loose mm. what ends do you have to tie up and be aware of that yeah all right um some of the things i like um you know if you are a wine person mm. we have a lot of lovely wine people have a have a wine tasting party oh. or something like that oh, yeah. you know but it is the grape right? The harvest of the grape. And the grapevine has been a, a great, um, we use it as the wheel of the year symbol a lot oh, in really? Wicca, like a, a, a wreath, a grapevine wreath, right? I've seen that. I didn't realize it was a grapevine. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And you can put, you know, depending upon which festival you're dealing with, you can put all different things on it and just keep that. But, you know, sometimes people do uh, like grapes and, and um, uh, fall colored leaves and acorns and things like that this time of year. Mm. But the, the, the one is really an empty grapevine wreath. Interesting. It represents the harvest completed. Ah, it's yes. done. Yeah. Right? And that circle that ever continues right there, you mm. know? It's knowing. <laughs> Again, as a culture, we go, 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 go. And a lot of times we, things, we leave things unfinished. Yes. The energy of that empty grapevine is that energy that goes, finish what you start, finish what you start, finish what you start Yeah. type of thing. Yes. So I love grapevines on the altar. It, or, go, or go to one of the wineries in Woodenville. Littered with wineries around Literally, here. Literally, go all over the place. Go to a winery and sit there and give thanks for the harvest. Wine was considered ambrosia of the gods, mm. right? Dionysus, Need, right? Yep. yep. And and there were points in time where it was only for monks and priests that they were allowed to make wine or beer or any of that. Right. This, well, I'm sure there was a controlling aspect of that, but the <laughs> other aspect of that is it's sacred. Fermentation 
is sacred. You are taking something that transforms through literally being eaten apart mm. in order to become something new right. that actually creates that euphoria of deep connection. And we know if you drink too much, there's that emotional thing that comes with it. It opens you to that place <laughs> yeah. of, of euphoria and joy and emotion and this sacred wine and its process all across the board can be a really great symbol hmm. of this time in certain ways. And it doesn't have to be alcohol. You can do whatever you want. You right. know what I mean? It can be cider. Yep. You know what I mean? Just the thing of cider. Apple cider is perfect. Uh, so some of the other things, offering, uh, because it is about acknowledging your bounty and your harvest and giving of it, mm. right? So giving of, you know, like donations at this time is mm. a great thing. Donating your time, donating your money. Like donating your time at a food bank is a great right, idea. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where can excess food go? Where can the excess be? Right. Right? Because when we really sit down, most of us can sit there and go, yeah, we have excess. No right. matter how close we think we're living to our paychecks, right. we have excess. Yep. Yep. I had an interesting uh, uh, realization of that. You know, within the past five years, I switched from corporate work into more personal work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went from my cushy ex salary to, you know, making considerably less than I, than I was making. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like at, at the beginning, it was shock because I was used to making this much money. Now I'm making, again, significantly less, but I'm living a much more comfortable quote unquote life because I realized how much excess that I was living in. Because when you're making money and you know I wasn't that responsible with saving it, I was just continuously spending it. Like I was just re just putting back in the economy and stupid shit, you know, stuff that made sense to me at the time. But, you know, I look back, I could see it's an excess, right? I didn't right. need that. And so now like having made less money or making less money, but feeling more comfortable than I ever felt and seeing where that excess lies, like now it's like, well, what else is excess? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure I, not, and not I'm trying to like whittle myself down to just having just enough to make it by, but just having that cognizance of, as much as it, my anxiety wants to make me think I'm living in the scarcity mode, mm -hmm. dude, you're living in abundance, right? You have an abundance of love in your life. You have an abundance of opportunities. You have an abundance of physical things that make you happy. You have an abundance of emotions that are there for you. Like there's so much there mm -hmm. that I don't really need more. Yeah. I mean, there's that symbol of the cornucopia. You see a right. lot of that around this time, or the harvest horn, right? Mm -hmm. Again, the horn is a phallic symbol. The harvest that comes out of the womb is the, you know, the goddess. So we have, but we have it filled to bounty right. at this time. Overflowing. Overflowing, because yeah, totally. that's the magic of this time, right? Because in times past, the harvest didn't always do that. Right. The harvest could have been horrible. Yep. So even putting the symbol of an overflowing cornucopia is trying to invoke that energy into your life, right? But it is overflowing, means when you have it, it flows out mm -hmm. from you outward to be shared. Yep. So it's never this, this is all about me and it's all coming to me. It's always about the, that deep connection of the flow. So that's why donating your time and donating your money mm -hmm. At this time is about that circle of reciprocity. Right. Super important. Yeah. Right? For us. You know, interesting, uh, just looking at current events that just recently went down, um, we have the Burning Man thing that just happened, right? So ah, Burning yeah, Man, yeah. Uh, there was big storms and you know, a lot of the, the participants got kind of stranded there for a little bit of time. I believe the, the news outlets over-aggrandized it as they do, then what, what do you know, the severity of what it actually was. We had friends that were there, they were like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of hard, but like we also we decided to come to the middle of the fucking desert. We're right. kind of prepared for this shit, right? right? And not downplaying anybody that had negative experience, but uh, I bring that up because like you you get to that abundance point, like po people prepare, right? They're going to be there for X amount of time. They're going to bring all their stuff. There's a lot of trade that happens there. There's not real money monetary system. They're on their own kind of like ideas, and so as things kind of went sideways. You know, there's definitely some 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 uh, negative things that happened from there, but also there's a lot of positivity that happened from that because people realized the abundance that they were sitting with, and saw other people that didn't have abundance and were like, "Hey, 
I will lessen my intake so you can have some, right? And then there that reciprocity started to show up. And then we started to give and to, you know, release some of what we thought was mine into the ethos to help humanity. Yeah. And that's the balance. So it's not, you know, what I like about Wicca is it's not just sitting in your head. This mm. isn't just a concept. Yeah. It's how you apply it to life. Right. And there's one. I mean, that's why I like physical activity, even in, in, in the rituals. Like I like a spiral dance at this time. And that spiral dance is symbolic of the active movement of going into the center, in to know what you need, mm. in to know what you are having to let go of all of that into the dark with all of these people spiraling in. And then it turns and it starts going outward okay. as to what you're going to bring out. So you have people going in and people going out and everybody crossing oh, and you're yeah. literally doing the balance of all things, of how all things happen. So to symbol, even doing tree pose while watching the sunset. There you go. Gang. Yeah. <laughs> right there. You know, walking on the sidewalk, one foot in front of the other on an edge. Know what it's like to actually have to find balance, mm. right? Yeah. Balance means you can't have too much and you can't have too little, right? Yep. So it's always that this process right now in order for that center to find that center. You can do it physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Mm. Um, one, another thing which I found interesting which I did one year with some friends, and it was really, really powerful, is there's an old, um, some old Celtic customs in Ireland. You, you visit graveyards at this time. Okay. Because at Samhain, the veils will open right up, right. and everybody comes in. And you kind of honor the dead with harvest and different things, so that there's a certain bit of placating. It's like, please... Don't wreck us when you come through the doors <laughs> on the other side. But it is acknowledging where you have come from. Mm. And that's part of the introspection of this time. It's not just what have you done in the past year. It's what has everybody done to get you here. Right, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's where honoring or a celebration or a little offering at a graveyard mm. is a really interesting thing because you are acknowledging that there are so many that came before you. Oh, I love that. I love that. So many that came before you in order for you to have this abundance in this moment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I do love that. Like getting a nice little bottle of wine and finding your local cemetery. Yeah. And just going to those who have come before and leave a bottle somewhere. Yeah. There you go. This one's for you, homie. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, there's, you know, in the, in the Western culture, um, we've aggrandized and maybe we're, we're finally getting away from this idea, but for a long time there was the self-made person, right? Mm. I've made it on my own. I did everything. You're full of shit, right? It's Nobody no ever has made it on their own. Yeah. You were birthed from somebody. So you had to get help to get in the life, right? Somebody gave you an opportunity. Somebody bought you dinner sometimes. Somebody gave you a place to sleep. Somebody gave you an idea. Somebody gave you a chance, right? Nobody is self-fucking-made, right? And so that idea that you just talked about shows that, like, you don't have to know where your help came from, but just know that you've received help at some point in time and honor the help that you've given, yeah. you've gotten, because you're probably going to be giving that to somebody too, whether you realize it or not. And so that reciprocity comes back again. Like, I've received... I remember at my, my first management job as a restaurant manager, I was lucky enough to have a very beautiful human being that was very human minded, not business minded, take care of me and teach me the ropes. And he's been a business mentor since that day. And now is a dear friend of mine, but he taught me how to respect the people and the information and where it came from. Not just be like, Oh, I'm the guy with all the fucking answers. Get out of my way. You know, I'm going to do the things. No. That information came from somebody, right? Honor where it came from and then honor how you're going to present it to somebody else, right? Don't be just the, 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 uh, the, the holder of information. This is my info. Sorry, you can't. It's proprietary. Get fucked. No, it's not. This is everybody's information. You just might be the one that's uh, interpreted that information for now, right? So how are we giving back and how are we understanding where we've gotten help so that we can reciprocate that help yeah. to somebody else? That's why it's important to find those, like, I, I like... That's why I think giving in some way at this time is important. Yeah. Sit there and go, and, and I, don't, I don't 
care whether you're going to donate your time, whether you're going to find, where you donate your money or you're going to help somebody else, whatever it is, do it in this season. Yeah. It is so good for the soul. It is so good for the humility that this country lacks in ways that are incredible. Yeah. Right? So autumn equinox, you find that balance point. No, at any point you can fall off that balance. And when you do, somebody's going to have to give in order for you to get back up. So, again, the great balance, important to take a look at. Um, so, another thing that I'd like to do, if you, if, you, if you don't have any other time, but we literally, in this part of the world, in the Pacific Northwest, have some of the most beautiful nature oh, wow. around. So good. Take the time to walk in nature and notice what is receding. Oh, okay. What is dying what is letting go? Okay. What is changing? And ask for their help. Mm. Ask, ask for, uh, just connect into that energy. Mm. Uh, it was just like I did with my Japanese maple. As I touched her and I went, may I have, you, may I have the courage to do what you do? Mm. So effortlessly. So effortlessly. Wow. May I know how to let go like you do. Yeah. Right, so that you can walk into the forest and see it all around you, and connect deeply to that energy in whatever way feels fit, and that can be simply by walking and noticing the color of the leaves turning mm. and things beginning to dry and brown. Let look at it and yeah. take it in. In in the the asking is is such a beautiful layer to put on there. <clears throat> I recently heard somebody talking about death and life and how. This person believes in reincarnation, which I, I love the ideas of reincarnation. Um, and they were talking about how um, when somebody dies in this, the, that's close to you in this life, um, their spirit has realized that all the help that they can give you in this life, in this physical life, is, is exhausted. And they have to go to the spiritual life to be able to help you now. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's where the spiritual family Beautiful. and the spirit guides, power animals, all that stuff comes from. And so with that kind of idea, we have things passing around us all the time, right? So nature, like you just talked about, and that's a cyclical part of that, that it's, it's, it's natural, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be rebirth, right? That, that, that Japanese maple is going to come back. So while it's transitioning and it's taken that the leaves have fallen off and the leaves have maybe transitioned to the other side, quote unquote, maybe that energy now that you've asked for, it can be helpful to you in this physical form because that spirit er uh, energy is now saying, Hey, guess what? We have a, we have a mission. We're not, we're somebody asked for our help. Danica, we're going to help Danica. Cool. Good. We have a, we have a, we have our autumn and our, and our spring figured out. Yeah. We're going to send that energy to Danica. So like that idea to me, just, it seems really beautiful. And it seems like, why aren't we asking for help from all of these things that are passing naturally around us, giving them, you know, maybe a mission to, to accomplish on the other side, you yeah. know, while they make their journey back. Yeah. There's a lot, even in different initiatory traditions, there are certain degrees where, you know, your teacher will tell you if it's time, mm. but there are certain degrees where, no, no, you have to ask. <laughs> you have to ask because if A, you don't have the humility, mm. then you're not at this point yet. And B, it is your asking that turns the key for everything to start. Because mm. you have to be ready before anybody else. In the beginning stages, teenagers and kids, yes, it's our elders that look at us and go, oh, you're ready now. Yeah. Right? But then somewhere between the shift between the 30s and the 40s, it is now you've moved into a place where you have to go, I'm ready now. Yeah. It is for me. But in order to do this, I need help. So I have to ask. That's all about knowing who you are and understanding humility and understanding that you can't do anything by yourself. Right. Right? And that, that's a different initiatory degree. That's a different level yeah. right and that's where autumn equinox comes in it's like walking through that western gateway mm -hmm. of that type of wisdom of knowing that there's humility and competence and how do you how do you bridge those yeah. and it comes by slowing down yeah. not by speeding up and, and that and maybe that's why a lot of the, the uh, eastern cultures families stay together, you know, as far as like your 
grandparents and great grandparents they like live with the families right so i was so like if my mom and dad were still alive you know they'd be living with me and imparting their wisdom with me and understanding of that you know and i think maybe that's that part of that that we're kind of missing in this culture is that we're so quick to just kind of shut away our our elders and and not receive that wisdom kind of like what we talked about earlier so like having those having that wisdom constantly in your household you see physically you see it you know you see the slowing down of humanity you see the wisdom that's being gained you see the impartment that that wisdom is helping with and maybe that's part of like you know that that slowing down part that we're just kind of shortchanging and moving past and that some of those different cultures you know have understanding of that and then realize the, the benefit that has instead of the potential like, well, I don't want my dad living here when he's in his 60s and I can't live my life. It's mm -hmm. like, well, think about the information and the help that your dad can actually provide you right. or that, that elder person. Right. And that and that elderhood does, it's, it's hard, I think, elderhood in this culture because we're very used to ignoring our elders. Yeah. Like they don't have wisdom. So then the elders become desperate alone and afraid and controlling yep. as well right so it, it it doesn't end up being this actual organic process it's still people desperately jockeying <coughs> for power position and to be heard yeah that's you a know good point. um so I, I would love that i think we have a ways to go mm -hmm. um a ways to go before we hit that. Yeah. But I think that ceremonies like this, at least for me as a pagan, remind me, vehemently remind me right. of, you know, if anything, it's all a dialogue. <laughs> right? It's a dialogue around a constant wheel that is always changing. No matter yeah. how many times we hit these different eight gate posts, they're different every time we hit them. And they're always changing. So... I am, um, you know, even even in the rituals that I do, this is the first one where things become less physically active and shifting more towards guided meditations mm. and things that go more inward and movements that are more gentle and all of those things. And it's the first time where I, you know, I do more guided meditations starting from autumnal equinox pretty much through Imolk and it starts to shift again outward at right. spring equinox. Okay. And I had somebody, I think it was last year, go, oh, it was so nice to actually just stop and do a guided meditation. I was like, oh, somebody noticed. You know? right. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, somebody noticed. But it was also realizing that they were really, really, it was nurturing to be able to slow down amidst a group of people and just go inward yeah. without anybody expecting you to do or be anything else but just be there right right so there's there's another bit it's it's also stepping into the just being at yeah. both of those equinoxes it really is about deeply acknowledging exactly where you are yeah and yeah, we gotta i mean one of my goals in life is to be a human being and not a human doing and I've been a human, oh, I love that. Yeah, I've been a human doing for so long and just do, do, do and just keep moving and moving and moving. And I've never, I mean, until maybe the past, maybe five, seven years, stepped into a being in mm -hmm. the actual being of the humanity and not just constantly like putting these goals in, in front of me that I know I can't reach, that are unachievable, and then beating myself up for them and not meeting them and blah, blah, blah. It's like, how do I just be? How can I just be? Right. I don't need to do all the time anymore. This is bullshit. Yeah. I, it's, it takes a while to get there, but <laughs> at some point I'm hoping I'm going to get there. I don't know if I'm ever going to get there, but I, it's always, at least no matter what, when you step into these points, you remind yourself of it and you hit it a little deeper every single time. You know, it's not about, uh, for me, you know, I'm a, an achiever in different ways. So if I take out that concept and just realize wherever you hit it, it's different and you have moved forward mm. every single time that that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. We can get caught up in achievements and I've, I've got, you know, was caught in that trap for a very long time and, you know, still find myself in there at times, but you know, at least I'm, I'm a little more cognizant about it, but man, yeah, just being happy with just what, what, what you can accomplish. Yeah. Right. You know, and I think that's, that's the grace that, that we would give to a child. Mm -hmm. Why can't we give it to ourselves? Yeah. 
you know. I, I remember being, uh, you know, I think I was out of sports by the time this happened, but uh, was was around during the advent or the popularization of uh, participation awards, uh-huh. you know. And I remember just people getting so pissed about it, you know. Why do you get an award? You got last place. You, this is the first place team over here. They get an award. You shouldn't get an award, blah, blah, blah. You're awarding you, mediocrity. Right. What's happening? You know, it's like, dude, it doesn't matter whether you whether you won all the things or lost all. You showed up. You did it. You sacrificed. You put yourself out there. Yes, be fucking rewarded for that, right? That's great. Good for you for doing that. And I think that, you know, like just show up. Just show up and see what happens, right? Don't worry about doing the thing the best. Don't worry about being the worst. Just show up and see what the fuck happens, you know, and just see how that experience moves you in some kind of way mm-hmm. take the take the goal the end result out of it you yep. know yeah i have a question for you actually yes. so in the southern hemisphere uh-huh. is there a change in... oh they flip it completely okay it's okay. the exact opposite for them it's spring equinox okay so yeah, absolutely so similar names similar rituals uh-huh. understanding it, is it, just... wicca yes absolutely okay. but there are so many people and i and that's why um a lot of paganism and Wiccan, all these things are as alive as they are is because it, everybody takes these kind of basic moments and shifts them into what works best agriculturally, environmentally cool. around them, right? So their harvest season in the Southern Hemisphere might feel different with different things and different, you know, different concepts, mm-hmm. but it is about that kind of pulling back. It may be more about pulling back as opposed to harvest, but it's all there. Cool. You know, so I love the flexibility, how you can adapt it to be whatever it is you actually need, as long as there's that through line that you are deeply watching at those points around that time, what has changed in the scope of the environment around you. And for me, that's also how it rolls over into that playing out in my life and my concepts and my body and my being and my connection to the divine. Yeah. It'd be interesting just as somebody that like yourself, that's so ingrained in, in, in practicing and all these things to maybe spend a year in yeah. the Southern hemisphere yeah. and to experience the wheel of life in similar fashion, but just different time of the year. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be yeah. very interesting to see just how it lands with you and, and, and the, like the, the results that maybe some, some of the aha moments you might have. from that. I'm hoping it would be, I, of course I've never done it, but in my brain, I'm hoping it would be like when I went to Ireland and had to drive on the wrong side of the road mm-hmm. with, or not the wrong, the other side of the road with the wheel on the other side of the car. And for me, it was, it was at first I got in the car and I am so me in this way. I went, well, I'm going to do this. Like I'm never that person who hides in the corner. I go, I'm going to do this, whether this like fails or whatever. Here I go. And I get in there and I'm like, oh my God. And I'm driving. And after five hours, it was like it was nothing else. Totally. You know what I mean? It's at first, those first five hours, you're like, oh my God, there's a car coming. Okay, okay. This is on the this side. Oh my God, I'm too close. It's on the wrong side. Like, da, 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 da. And then by the third, fourth day there, I was just like a Manhattan driver all over again. Uh-huh. You know, so I feel, you know, for me in my world, I would hope it would be similar to that, where at first I jump in, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> but then I'd be like, yep, there it is. There it's we go. just same thing, different day. Here we are, you know. <laughs> I love that. And I actually, I spent some time in Australia and uh, driving on the other side of the road. And, you know, it, for the most part, it was all, it, it made sense. But what really confused me was the blinker and the the, uh, the windshield wipers were switched on the steering column. Oh. And so every time I tried to turn, I would hit the windshield wipers. <laughs> and, and it was fine and all fun and games until I was driving home slightly inebriated from a bar. Oh, gosh. And a cop pulled behind me. And my girlfriend at the time... I was driving. She was in the passenger seat, and I'm like, "Hey, there's a cop behind us." She's like, "It's fine, Australia. They're not going to pull you over unless you're doing something blatantly stupid. They don't really care." And I'm like, turning a corner, I hit the windshield wipers, and I'm like, "I'm oh my god, I'm going to jail in Australia. They can tell I'm drunk." They didn't fucking care. But it was just funny. It was one of those moments of like, "God damn." <laughs> I know it's it's really interesting, but I think it's also um, that type of flip. I think is important so that you're never so set. Right. In a specific way that you 
can't be open to the necessary changes and adaptations that happen right. through all of these processes. And it could be something simple. Like I, I was uh, listening to somebody about something, just like changing your, your behavior patterns. Start with just brushing your teeth with the opposite non-dominant hand, <laughs> right? So I've been every morning for the past two months, I've been brushing my teeth with my left hand awkwardly, like hit my nose sometimes. I'm like, oh, this is so weird, you know? But, you know, but it, it helps me wake up because I'm not just... Yeah, I have to think about it. Yeah. I'm using my left hand. I have to make circles. I have to rotate. I have to not hit my tongue. Whereas with my right hand, I'm just like, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. I have to sleep still. You yeah. Know? So yeah. having that, having that change, and having the, the awareness for the change, and being being witness to that that change for you. Yeah, love it. Love yeah. it. Well, Danica, you are amazing, and I again appreciate your uh, your time and all the information you've shared over these eight episodes. We've had nine technically, but the first one was about something different. Yeah. Um, so if you ever want to check out all the eight episodes, uh, they are on our uh, on the podcast. Uh, you can search Danica's name. You can go through them all. Uh, every single of the eight sabbats is on there. This is the last one we're putting out. Uh, we will definitely have Danica back on again, talk about some other cool shit that you're just very fluent in, whether it's theater or paganism <laughs> or Wiccan holiday, whatever it is. Right. But, uh, but I'm deeply grateful for you. Uh, oh, I, it has been so wonderful to do this with you, Adam. I, and I love that it's out there now for anybody who wants to hear this yes. and it's there. And that is, um, you know, it's an exciting thing for me, but it's also the fact that we've done all eight. There is, there is a completion, yes. you know, we're yes. in the autumn equinox and there is a completion wow. that is happening and the harvest and the, you know, for me, the gratitude that I have for the opportunity that you have given to me, wow. the gratitude that I have for the knowledge that we have shared, you know, I just, it, it's one of those things where I'm having a cornucopia moment. Yeah. <laughs> the gratitude is flowing. Hell so yes. there it is. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to find out what we're going to talk about next. Yay. What we can dig into. But, uh, but thank you again. Appreciate you. Thank you, Adam. See you soon. Thank you so much for spending time with Danica and I. Uh, please check out uh, the show notes for ways to get in touch with Danica or to support the show. Also, if you're interested on the other seven episodes about the eight Sabbaths in the Wheel of Life, please check out the show notes. I'll leave the, the links in there as well. Obeisance and love. We'll see you next time.